welcome to Ask April and Cindy. This is the first of a series of six of these that we've got scheduled once a week for the next several weeks. And uh, we would like to take this time to walk through some of the locations and destinations that both April and I have been to and are planning to go to in the future. Uh, so we can just share with you the things that we know about those areas and uh, maybe make uh, inspire you to uh, take a trip yourself. So this week's uh, destination is New England, and that's where uh, April goes for some of her fall photography. So it's a perfect time. We're not there yet, and I know she has some trips planned for this coming fall. So April, let's we're just yeah. going to walk through some of our questions. Um, so the first question we I wanted to ask April is what dr draws you to the New England area and why why is that uh, special for you? Um, I think I've, I can share a quick little story going back probably in the fifth grade. We had that school project where we did a family history research and drew up our family tree. And in, in that process, I realized that a lot of my family members, like many Many of us probably settled on the East Coast when they came from Europe or other countries coming to the United States. And interestingly enough, um, many years later, my father stumbled upon one of the oldest native brick houses in New England. And it has to, and it happens to be a direct descendant. Uh, we are a direct descendant of that family, the Weeks family. And it's just outside of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I don't know. Um, I decided I needed to go to that area and just kind of feel that landscape and walk in those places. But to actually have a physical building that's still standing that I could walk in and kind of, I don't know, take a trip through time and kind of imagine what it might have been like to be an early settler, you know, pre history of the Americans and so forth. It, it just really drew me and it continues to draw me as well as photographically and scenically. Um, the New England fall foliage is world renowned for the bright red colors, the orange leaves, the just the bucolic landscapes of red farms and um, you know some landscapes that I think even nationally now are getting recognized as kind of stepping back in time, buildings and places that have not been bulldozed and turned into strip malls and uh, Walmarts as such. So that in right. a nutshell is kind of why I continue each year to go back because these places change and with climate change, each season, each year is different um, just by the nature of the change of the colors. So, Right, right. And so your kind of original hook to New England was sort of an ancestral thing. So you have a physical connection to a building with your ancestors, right? right. Did I get that right? Right. And so you continue to, to want to seek out the small towns and even just walk through the graveyards, it's kind of like a mystery search. It's like, will you find another relative or a remnant of maybe a place that they lived or walked or, you know, maybe there's people still there that are descendants, you know, distant cousins or something. I don't know, it just kind of, it draws you. It just, it for me, it does. Right. <laughs> right, I, well, I think there's a lot of people taking pil pilgrimages and, uh, and journeys to kind of feel their roots and where they came from. So I think that's a, a beautiful thing to know know that that's part of your your draw and as you said it changes every year so um each time you go back it's a little bit different and i'm sure you discover something new right every time you yeah, go back you really, yeah you really do each time or something's changed or just you happen upon a different road and sometimes those are intentful i'll look at a map and there's so many covered bridges in vermont i mean i think it would take many many years and many days <laughs> and journeys to go see all of them, but, and sometimes it's just happenstance. I mean, honestly, GPS doesn't always work in these areas. So you kind of have to have a mix of maps and GPS because I have honestly gotten myself lost and ended up literally pulling off and asking like, I'm all turned around. I need to get to the X town. How do, how do I get do, there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's great because that leads us right to the next question because we have some kind of logistical questions about visiting these places. So you, know, you tell, talk a little bit about how you get around when you're in New, New England spans several states, right? I think it's like Maine, right. Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, so are you primarily driving those uh, those areas or is there other ways to navigate that if someone were to take a trip in that area? Um, primarily, I fly in and rent a car and drive those areas, but I also would think it would be wonderful to say fly into Burlington, Vermont, 
and just spend two or three days in that location and you could walk, you could stay in the historic downtown area, you could, um, they've got a ferry from Burlington that goes across to New York State across Lake Champlain. There wow. are a few trains uh, that run from Canada into Vermont, so you could even do that or definitely Boston. We hear a lot about Boston. It's Boston's a place I think you kind of have to dedicate to itself. And I would definitely not recommend a car in Boston. There's just a lack of parking. It's really tight. I would highly recommend if you go to Boston, don't rent the car until you are ready to leave Boston or, you know, so put it at the beginning or the end of a trip or just make it a separate destination on its own. Right. Because it sounds like even though when you go, you try to see a number of things in that New, New England area. It sounds like you could also just go and be, you know, in one, even you know, one town, Boston or some of these other places and just stay for a while and really enjoy it. So it might take several trips to New England to get to see. Oh, yeah, exactly. And I've also seen a really interesting, uh, there's a couple people now that are starting to offer an end to end walking tour. So you guess mm. you could fly in and get to the first location and then literally, um, they move your luggage from one end to the next and give you a route. And I honestly, I would love to almost do that one day is have that time to just walk it. I mean, we see right. so much more when we can walk and, and just enjoy and take the time instead of rushing past things. Right. That sounds beautiful. I, I'm, I'm sure there's some biking tours that do that too. Oh. That, what a, I had thought about the walking it would be because they're not that far apart right some no, of these little small towns yeah the little towns really aren't that far apart so yeah bicycling uh, a motorcycle all of those would be wonderful ways and the roads are there most of the what i would call the best or scenic roads are the two-lane roads the traffic's a little slower and i think when planning sometimes that trips people up they think oh i'm gonna fly into boston and get all the way to acadia national park and then head over here to, you know, New York State and do the Hudson River and they try to pack in too much. And right. you can't draw, you know, if you want to get off on the back roads and enjoy the covered bridges and sample some maple syrup and that this and that, you're going to be driving much slower, like 40 miles an hour, um, you know, that kind of speed versus 60, 70, 80 miles that we get used to, you know, on the right. freeways here in LA. Right, and if you've taken your camera, you're stopping three or four times to right. take. Oh, easy. Through. Right, you're not just, yeah, there's too many things that you didn't even know were gonna be there or sites that you didn't know you were gonna see. So, and now let, let's ask this question too, like where where are some of the places that you stay and what would you recommend when people are planning their trip to look for in their um, overnight lodging? Um, there's lots of choices when it comes to overnight lodging. Um, there's everything from Airbnb and some of the larger locations. There's some wonderful little mom and pop hotels, which I tend to seek out. They might be a little bit older, but it, you're kind of, you get that feel then for what it might've been like, like in New Hampshire, it's um, got a lot of lakes. And it's, to me, it's like, you know, that whole idea of staying in a little cabin by the lake and, you know, just enjoying that is just a wonderful thing. And, and you can afford that versus, you know, Kind of the same experience you might get there are chains you know you've got your holiday inns and your marriott's and whatnot but to me that's going to be same experience you know somewhere else whereas i'd rather take advantage of maybe an old inn you know maybe a bed and breakfast where they actually you know make breakfast right from the you know the chickens are laying the eggs out back in the farm and they're collecting the maple syrup from the trees. I mean, those are the kinds of experiences you can really have and they don't all have to be super expensive. So there's a right. wide range of choices as far as lodging. Right, and so taking those kind of like boutique hotels, the smaller ones, and then you also maybe get that, uh, like you were trying to describe, sort of this local feel, right? Like you're, you're right. these people have lived there for a while, they know the area, the food is coming maybe from their farm or for farms nearby, so it's a different experience if you if then if you if you stay in an Airbnb obviously then you're probably by yourself right right um, right which is different you know I think that's why I think I enjoy kind of the little inns or even um, there's a mom and pop hotel just outside of it's on the south side of Burlington and this gentleman you know you walk into the office he's can you know he's honestly interested in having a conversation he wants to tell you what you know what's new in town or where a new restaurant has popped up or have you thought about 
you know, if you are a photographer, he'll be able to point out places that I may not have even found before. Um, if you're a bicyclist, same thing, he's going to recommend a great little country road that maybe not as much truck traffic is on so you can be safer and enjoy some really unique experiences that you might not have found in a guidebook or online because he lives there. Right, right. And they're obviously going to know if things are closed or don't go on Wednesday. I mean, the guidebook's not right. meant to tell you that. It's a great place for dinner, but don't go on this night, you know, or yeah, exactly. or you should go on this night. Yeah, that that's uh, you only get those from the locals and staying with those kinds of places. That's great insight, April. I like the idea of staying at bed and breakfasts. And I think that kind of has it really does. The it, adds, it adds to the experience. And once you meet these people, I mean, you really do get more of a sense of what kind of lifestyle it is and just their background. And I've taken some people on my tours that they've never really left yet Los Angeles. So their concept of driving through a little town that has just a post office, a cafe, and if you're lucky, you know, maybe the school is in that town, but it might be three towns over. They, they're not used to that. It looks like a movie set to them. And to realize that, no, people do live like that. And it is, not everyone can live that way day to day, but other people, it's such a beautiful experience and, and they don't realize those experiences still exist and are possible. Right. Like you said, they think it's a movie set because it feels <laughs> like something they've only seen on TV before. And I and I was just thinking as you were talking about the bed and breakfast, like that used to be the way we traveled before Airbnb and before some of these right. things that was very common. And now uh, some of those are probably having challenges, right? Um, because Airbnb is kind of pushing that. But I like the idea of meeting with locals and interacting with them. So I think that's a, a good way to, you know, add to your your journey versus just going and you know staying in your hotel room or your airbnb by yourself right. at the end of the evening here you can maybe interact or have dinner or at least breakfast with them um that's great um okay so another question what um what are some of the things that if somebody were to take a trip to the new england area what would you tell them not to miss can you give us a couple i'm sure there's oh, 20 yes. let's let's stick with a couple <laughs> yeah i made a wonderful for anyone that's listening to and i know we must not mention this in the write-up there will be if you provided your email address um be sure you do that we i made a wonderful pdf document that i can send to you with some suggested places to stay and just some of the wonderful things not to miss i mean there's such a variety in the new england states um like in Maine, I put, if you visit the Kenny Bunkport area, which is kind of a more upscale, like old school, upscale, old money. A lot of people realize Kenny Bunkport, they associate it with um, kind of the Bush era, the Kennedys, that whole kind of, you know, mystique going on there. And you can, you can drive past uh, the Bush compound and see it out there. But just that area, it was a lot of old money from the shipping captains. And what I would do in Maine is make sure to take a lobster boat. Um, and some of them aren't very expensive or they also have ma what they call mail boats where they li literally still deliver the mail, the US mail to people that live on these little islands. And wow. if you find the schedule, you can hop on. It's not very, ex I don't know that all of them charge in fact, and you can go out for the day and get a really unique sense of what it's like to live on these islands. But the lobster one is kind of my favorite to kind of see how the lobster industry is working and how this, this is a family thing. Some of them have handed, been handed down that position or that um, business from past generations. And it is changing with, again, climate change and just the way of the demand for lobster, just like any other things we enjoy um, in the population it's getting harder and harder to continue to maintain that lifestyle and make a living. So it's a very, you know, it's kind of hard. <laughs> and what it's, what it's not all glamour and being on a boat all day, but it's really, it's a beautiful way to see the main coastline and enjoy seeing how the lobsters are collected. And often at the end, sometimes they do do a lobster bake and you can enjoy a nice meal with a small group of people. That sounds great. That's awesome. And anything else in that uh, not to miss category or? Oh, definitely. I mean, each state, that's what I like. I mean, Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont are kind of the three states I spend most of my time in because they're close together and you can easily get a taste of each. Um, Maine has got miles and miles of coastline. You've got lighthouses and these you know, quaint little villages and towns. And then if you hop over to New Hampshire, I would definitely not miss 
the Pinkamangas Highway. It's uh, 34 miles long, and, but I would allocate probably a good half a day, maybe five, six hours, especially if you want to get out of your car, which I highly recommend. The road follows a river and goes up and over a little pass, and the leaves in the fall on this route are, again, it's worldwide renowned. I would try to avoid going there on a weekend, or if you do decide that's the only day that's going to fit into your schedule, start your day early so that there'll be room in the parking lots to pull off and, and get out of your car and take the paths and enjoy the leaves and the waterfalls and all of that. Um, and then Vermont is, is uh, it's very different as well. You've got a little red farmhouses, lots of, you can go taste maple syrup, you can stop and visit, do a little Ben and Jerry's factory tour. I, I like the food stops. I like to actually go see where they collect the maple syrup and you know, taste all the different grades of maple syrup. That's a lot of fun. So, right. Wow. You've just tons of stuff that, that <laughs> we, can, we can do there. It's everything from like foodie to hiking, and you know, just it's amazing what New England could hold. Um, so, you've been, do you have any idea how many times you've been or how many years you've been going back, April? I've been going back probably a good 15 years consistently. Wow. Probably only missed one or two years at most. Um, I just love it. I think I don't feel like growing up in the Midwest, it's just fall is kind of part of my soul. I feel like if I don't go somewhere and experience the change of the leaves and walking through them and that Christmas in the air and just the smells and sights and change of the season, I don't, I don't know. It's just somehow stuck in my soul and I always feel like I have to go. So, you know, just experience that and then just some of the stories I've encountered um a great little quip I'll share really quick is I had a small group and we usually try to travel in one SUV and I parked in front of a country store and country stores are kind of like uh what you'd equate like a 7-Eleven they've got a little bit of everything in there you can go in there and get a fresh made sandwich sometimes you can pick up your mail there it's just kind of like the community you know everything a little grocery store and I literally park the car and we're carrying, you know, a lot of our camera gear and it's just habit growing up in LA now or being in LA now, get out of the car, lock the door. As soon as I walked in the door, this older woman behind the counter goes, you're not from these parts, are you? I mean, just like, she, I mean, she literally just popped her head up and, and I was like, uh, I didn't even know what to say at first. <laughs> right. I, it took me a minute to kind of determine, like, do I look different? I mean, what about me? I, it didn't even occur to me until, she, and then she said, because I think she saw, I just looked like totally lost, like a sheep. Like, she's like, we don't lock our cars around here. <laughs> right. I mean, gr cars. growing up, we didn't even lock our front door. Um, it's like, it was, I never, I don't think I ever had a key to my house when I was a kid. Oh, like, wow. That, that would have been crazy. Yeah. And then from there, it's like while we were in that little country store, you know, looking at all the wonderful local jams and jellies and wondering about a couple of people came in. I, I think a couple of guys came in and picked up a, you know, like a six pack or something. It must have been Friday night. And, and she goes, oh, well, do you want to put that on your tab? And I'm thinking, who does? I mean, this is probably like only five years ago. Like, who does that? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so like, Let's see you again, and you, yeah, just take what you want. We'll just put it on your tab when you want to pay me. <laughs> yeah, that's too funny that that's still that those kinds of things still happen in those small towns, and that they have that kind of a relationship with the community, which is which is actually in itself a whole experience is to be in, in a community where they feel that way, and you're surrounded. You feel like an outsider, like you said, but it's also just a a novel way to look at the world. You're looking at it in a different way. Yeah, uh, exactly. So in, in the 15 years that you've been going back, do you have a, a travel lesson or a mishap or something that's happened to you that you can share? Are we always good to, to learn from each other, some lessons learned that you've had? Um, definitely. And um, going back to what I mentioned earlier and what I try to share with people, if I I do also a lot of itiner itinerary stuff. And sometimes, you know, people want to go and do it themselves or whatnot. Um, I always try to warn people, like, it's nice to have the GPS, but don't rely on it. You really need to have a paper map or kind of a sense of which direction you're going, because a lot of the road signs will tell you um, the name of the town. They won't say east or west or north or south or 
what now you kind of got to know which town you're heading towards and even then i've gotten off on some roads and realized there's no sign i'm not really sure where i'm going but i'm just gonna <laughs> keep driving and as i said i was in new hampshire and i had some people with me and i thought i'd plan it all out how to get to the particular um bed and breakfast place we were staying for the night and it's now getting dark and i kept turning around and i, I just got completely disoriented of which direction what sign name i must have gone back to the intersection i don't know maybe a couple of times i'm not even sure at one point it was I wasn't seeing any businesses. I was in the woods. I could tell, like, I wasn't even sure which way the road was going. So finally, I see a little light barely on in a business. And I, I'm i like, oh, my gosh, I got to pull in here. I went in there. And even they were confused, like, where I was going, the name of the place. So we literally got on the phone together. They helped me because my cell phone wasn't working. Uh, certain areas, you don't have cell phone coverage. And... And then they helped me get turned back around. But I probably spent a good hour, maybe two hours extra getting all turned around and lost. And your heart is pounding because you're like, oh, no, am I going to find my bed tonight? <laughs> but, right. Are you going to make it? Yeah. But you just got to go back to like, you know what? There are good people in the world and you just got to stop and ask. You know, don't be too proud to stop and ask or, you know, pull out your map and try to make use of it if you can. But even then, sometimes, like I said, roads are road Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things in those smaller communities. I mean, even in other countries, when you're out in the rural area of a community, when they don't have, you know, they don't believe in street signs, right? You know, right. it's like, the, it's the third house on the left, you know, I, I know I've been on a few trips where I've been told, oh, you should go here. And they give me these cryptic directions, <laughs> uh, oh which are... Gosh little bit crazy and and then if it does get dark that's even worse i i definitely understand that once it gets dark then the streets you can't even tell where you're at and the landmarks are all gone yeah, you're not even sure if the landmarks are gone you're not sure if you're yeah at that point i was like oh please don't start raining because that'll just make it worse That'll make it even worse. Yeah, and I think that's really good advice for a lot of people to not solely rely on their map. I mean, or on their GPS so that they should have a map. I almost always have a paper map. map. Matter of fact, I always have a paper map. <laughs> I have a little bit of a map problem um, but I always have a paper map of the location that I'm going and most of the time even the city um, I don't typically whip it out you know when I'm out and about I do use my GPS like the rest of the people in 2020 but um, it's nice to know that in my you know in my bag I have a map in case I get lost or turned around I also like to look at the bigger picture and it helps me orientate myself so I think that's really good advice april is to you know one not be afraid to ask questions like you said don't don't be shy and it's okay um right, and then two, exactly don't always rely 100 percent on that gps because it's not they don't know those small roads and i mean even driving here in la lots of times it'll tell me to turn here and it's like that's not a road you know? right exactly <laughs> So it's, it can be wrong. And if that's your sole source of like, you know, orientation, you can absolutely get turned around. So that's really good advice. And it would work in any location, but it sounds like New England, you're on those little roads, right? That's going to be a big yeah, part of it. That's going to be a big part of your journey. Exactly. Right, right, right. Okay, well, we're wrapping up to the end. We've got a few minutes left, and I don't know um, if anybody has any questions, but I'm going to look real quick. I don't think we have any here um, on the chat board. So before we finish off, April, is there, you wanna just share anything else about New England? And I'm gonna go pull the dates up for the, the next one so we can share that also. Um, I don't think, I think a lot of times with New England, we all wanna go there at fall foliage season. And that is, that is honestly probably one of the best times to go worldwide. I don't, I don't disagree with that, but it, it does require planning ahead. I highly recommend planning ahead. Um, I think gone, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens this year, of course, in light of uh, what's happening with our health scare at the moment. But I still think you kind of want to have some places picked out if you're, if you're going to be there over a weekend to sleep, unless you're really okay with just taking a chance and paying whatever price you have to pay to find a bed at some point because 
some of the weekends, a lot of these small towns have a lot of small colleges, you have a lot of universities, and so you have other activities besides just the draw of the fall colors. And you have people coming from all over the world. Um, each year that I've gone back, I continue to see more and more international tourists. And, and they're just as excited to see our fall colors, whether they're from Japan or China or I mean, it, the numbers are just have been just staggering. So it'll be interesting to see what happens this fall, of course. But I do personally know I've already spoken to some of my lodgings and they already have bookings for some of the weekends. So it's really wise to plan ahead and think where you might want to sleep or, you know, be willing to change your plans a little bit so you can be in an area that's not as popular. Right, right. Because it sounds like it's easily to be, um, you know, booked up and you might not be able to find lodging if you don't book in advance. So right. that's, and that's pretty typical of a, of a destination that is seasonal like that. If people are going to the destination specifically for that, like the German, um, the Christmas uh, bazaar, oh, yeah. that kind of stuff. Like there's just, if you're going to be in that area at that time, you're probably going to need to book that in advance, right? Right, exactly. So, um, okay, so I did pull up the dates. Our next two um, Ask April and Cindy sessions are, there's one on Wednesday, March 25th, which is two weeks from today, and that's gonna be April again, and we're gonna talk about Alaska. And then on Wednesday, April 1st, um, at the Ask April and Cindy, we're gonna ask me about Prague. So we have a few more of those, but those are the next two, on um, March 25th and then April 1st at 6 p.m. So you can call in and uh, listen to us live. And if you join the Google Hangouts on your computer, you can also chat and just send us some questions during the chat and we're at the end and we'll try to ask those. We don't have any questions today, but we'll just keep trying that going forward. I mean, hopefully this is valuable. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, hopefully you'll um, drop me an email. I've got a really nice um, three page PDF if anyone's interested to send you with some of my lodging choices, um, some of the must sees and some of the um, places you wanna go eat even. So with websites and some other information, so. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be doing that after each one of these sessions too. So anybody who was uh, joined us today will get that PDF from April on the details of some of the things she talked about today. And we'll do that at the end of each of those sessions as we go forward. So I think that's it. We're look, it's right at 6.30. We are really good, April. <laughs> I was trying to like time it so we were right on time and we just, it just turned from 29 to 30. I feel really proud of myself. Um, so we will end our session now and uh, hopefully we'll hear from other folks the next couple of weeks as we do this again. Thank you everybody for joining us and have a great night. Thank you everyone, goodbye.